Well, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for welcoming me uh, tonight in this uh, very prestigious university. I've met some of you, and uh, it was already a great time, and I'm very happy to continue it now. Just remember, uh, some few years ago, a terrible storm hit the real estate planet. This storm called uh, subprimes hits uh, planet so severely that hundreds of thousand millions lost their job, uh, became homeless. This morning of uh, August 29th, um, I didn't know, I was not aware in 2007, I was not aware that I will lose my comfortable position as a European Vice President for a leading international company, that I will lose my comfort, my German car and the rest. I, I was not aware that a tsunami, tsunami just arrived. Look at this. When it comes to bailouts of American business, Barney Frank and the Congress may be just getting started. Nearly two trillion tax dollars have been shoveled into the hole that Wall Street dug, and people wonder, where's the bottom? It turns out the abyss is deeper than most people think, because there is a second mortgage shock heading for the economy. In the executive suites of Wall Street in Washington, you're beginning to hear alarm about a new wave of mortgages with strange names that are about to become all too familiar. If you thought subprimes were insanely reckless, when you hear what's coming. This diagram established by the economist uh, Robert Schiller shows the history of American home value for the last hundred years. It's starting in 1890 and goes to uh, the recent event of 2007-2008. It is based on sales price of standard existing houses, not on new construction, to track the value of housing as an investment over time. As you see, 1929 is an incredible abyss preceding a, a jump up, and obviously in this diagram, the curve of 207, 208 is just so dramatic. This other diagram reports the same type of information when dealing with the new home sales since 1963. Here again, the fall is totally dramatic. And this other graphic is showing the same evolution. Yes, this afternoon of August 2007, while driving my OD, I was not aware that a severe shock was going to transform my life and putting me down from a leading position to starting it all over again. And uh, as some say, we moved from rich to rags. My favorite is Tex Avery, you know, in the 50s, incredible people. So that's in that context that we started the construction of uh, Swiss Development Group. I met with a friend investor and um, we decided to create a real estate company devoted to lifestyle, real estate mixing unsurpassed type of services and facilities with the highest patrimonial investment. But uh, before to go any further, I'd like to uh, tell you, introduce myself a little bit. Um, I am an architect. I graduated from the School of Beaux-Arts in Paris. I jo jo joined the University of, of Cincinnati, where I graduated in the Master of Science program. And uh, I should say we, because my wife and I have been following the same courses and we graduated together. So just a few images for my background to illustrate what has been my business for the last 30 years. A few images to show you some different programs I've been contributing to. Capesterre on the French Riviera, it's about uh, 100,000 square meters of construction, 7,000 beds, all of them operated and, and to, uh, under a hotel banner. Um, near Saint-Tropez, Parc de Grimaud, the same, and uh, other projects on the west coast of France. Pont Royal, a project I'm particularly proud of because what you see on this 
picture, everything has been built from scratch. All you see is totally artificial. The lakes, the slope of the village, the golf course, everything was created by the company when we started the work together. And just to make a small one, the village was not having sufficient slopes to open views on the surrounding countryside. So we made savings by building up the parking lot on the ground, organized the village on the parking lot. Quickly again, Flaine Mont Soleil and uh, my baby, Arc 1950, the award winning resort that I had the chance to develop and build from A to Z and uh, have a long term relationship with uh, uh, the American landscaper Eldon Beck, which I salute tonight. With SDG, we have developed several projects, one of which is Duparc, uh, Gary knows it well. It's a former hotel from the Belle Epoque that we transform into private residential units with hotel services. And I can continue on. Sassue with project with chalet designed by Foster and the best of the best, and that's why I am very glad that Gary is there. Uh, the project we will come back later on. When we started to speak about the theme of this lecture with Mark, uh, the initial idea I had was to cover um, the real estate development process without my experience of these last years. And uh, Mark told me that uh, it would be more interesting to focus on the direct experiences uh, I, I met during this time. So the presentation is um, not going to be so technical, but more oriented toward what experiences I've been through and uh, what type of uh, values or what type of information I could be given to you that could be useful. The development process, all the steps work like in the clock, clock light scheme. Prospection starts, acquisition is coming, and then envisioning, master planning, especially when you're dealing with resort making. Development itself, construction, delivery, etc. This does not pretend to be a holistic description of the process. Obviously, there are parts of the domain that are totally absent, which are very important. I'm not speaking of sales and marketing, these are speaking about financial support or accounting, and all these participate to it. But here they are seen as tools towards the service of the development process. But we need to, to agree on what we call uh, development first. Because uh, surprisingly enough, um, development is not understood the same way um, if you're in a country or another. Uh, in France, in many countries uh, of Western Europe, development is understood as acquisition. It's creating new business. You're purchasing a piece of land, you're, you're in development. Whereas, on the contrary, working with Canadians or Americans, the development is understood as a dynamic process of growth from an original ID to the delivery of the building. We'll come back on that if you want. Starting a new business, looking for a land plot to create a new project, purchasing an existing building to renovate it, all these start by prospection. The first question one should wonder when dealing with prospection is, in which business am I in? What are we doing? What is the set of parameters that could describe the, the, the property I'm looking for? For instance, if you're looking to build Wisteria Lane, the famous street of Desperate Housewife, you would probably look for a quiet environment close to school, easy transportation, and not that access from the highway that could disrupt the, 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 the quality of life. On the contrary, if you're looking to a place to build a hotel, uh, the location nearby the exit on the interstate would be crucial because it would bring customers. So what business are you in is the first question to wonder in the prospection. 
after my experience of these last uh, years showed me that uh, the first quality of the developer dealing with uh, acquisition and prospection should be flair. Think about the truffle hound. These type of dogs are able to find these truffles and uh, flair is not something that is gifted. Flair is something that you train yourself to. And uh, I think um, that's a very important stuff to develop. And uh, you see it's a very humble job that the dog is doing. It's also a matter of common sense, uh, no matter the school. This matter that no school will teach you. Uh, you know, I was told by a former teacher that uh, at the time of uh, the development of me mechanical, uh, the first car were coming, uh, the, the, the lack of common sense has led some people to try to make assembly lines to create diligences. Flair is leading to a question, do you feel it? You can, you can find a place that meet all the requisites for a new project and still you don't feel it. The question of feeling it is very important. In the antiquity, I'm very fond of antiquia. In the antiquity, the, the Roman used to believe that any objects, a table, chair, a piece of land, uh, an animal had a genius protector. So a piece of land to develop a project was protected by a genius lodgy, the genius of the place. And they used to send priests to check if the genius lodgy was present. When dealing with uh, a new project, I think you can meet all the requisites, but if you don't feel it, don't buy it. I, I have a, a funny example that happened to me uh, years ago. Uh, I, I was working with a real estate agent who was in charge of finding the place for the headquarters of a very famous world fashion designer. If you promise not to repeat, it was Paco Rabanne. And uh, I was looking with it because we could make a joint venture and develop a resort project nearby the property. So we looked at that for one year. And finally, he found a property that was meeting all the prerequisites of the client. The castle was at the right distance from the city. The distance to the highway was okay. There were woods, there was a sufficient size of land and the development was perfect. So I was not there, but uh, this guy called Paco Rabanne who came with his staff and they entered the lobby of the, of the castle and Paco just said, there's no genius lodge here, and he left. And so this story could be, seem stupid, but there's really uh, an impact, yes? Uh, if flair and feel is something that you train, how do you train it? How do you train it? It's a good question. Um, I think by doing a lot of uh, transaction. I think by practicing the transaction with others and uh, by studying a lot of making feasibility studies and comparing. Uh, that's a less stupid answer I can give you, I think. Another advice uh, would be um, in this business of acquisition, if you're working for a leading company in this type of domain, hospitality and so on, you will receive phone calls every now and then to tell you, you know, I've got the best property to show you. Could you please come tomorrow to Las Vegas, to San Francisco or elsewhere? So the first advice I could tell you, give you is use your brain, not your legs. Study on the paper. Get all the information and data gathered on your face before to take the plane ticket. Because if not, you're going to have a heavy mileage uh, of free tickets, but no business going on.
The work of developing a project is also something that looks a little bit like the nurse taking care of a, of a baby. You know, uh, I, I always thought about that. For many projects, I've been coming along with. Um, you know, I, w I was a developer, so I was getting the baby uh, to, to, be, to be born, getting the administrative authorization, the permit, buying the land, and suddenly when the project is starting, nobody knows you anymore. And uh, it, it's really like a nurse. It's really very comparable, and the travel hand and the nurse they have something in common. But let's go through the third quality, which you need to develop in order to be a, a satisfactory developer in prospection and acquisition. Look out. Look out. The future is your business. You know, ju just to give an example, uh, coming back to the curb earlier, you know, what would you think about somebody purchasing an important property at the peak of 207? it would be uh, probably a, a lack of consideration of the future. So look out, the future is your business. Any type of means, information, the TV, the radio, newspaper, should tell you information, and you're the only one to make the decision at the end if you believe or not in this type of information or not. So just to finish this first section, uh, I think uh, it's not mandatory what they teach in uh, business school or in some places, but I think the first virtue you need to develop in order to do correctly this job is humility, just like the dog, the hound looking for truffle, or the nurse, or the lookout, the watchtower, this is a common value. In this day and age, there's so much information available uh, that we need to filter through. And, and in order to kind of like look out to the future and decide and be informed and all that, how do you personally kind of decide to filter through the process to go through and what do you pay most attention to? What kind of people do How do you filter the information? I think we, we will come to that. I think there are two important tools. One is figures. You, you need to use a simplified pro forma economic analysis. And the other one is uh, information going through words. But if you allow me, I, I'll be going on a little further and coming back on your questions, if I may. Second part of it is evaluation and acquisition. Maybe it's a part of the answer uh, of your question. How do you evaluate? How do you know it's the right one? I have a first trick to tell you. The profit you make, usually, in the majority of cases, you make it when you buy it. The profit you make it on the very first day you're purchasing the land or the building. If you buy too expensive, well, the project is going on, but the result will be the same at the end. So it's a very important part of the evaluation. After you've been through this uh, evaluation of project and you're decided to purchase, and uh, you're going to tell me, how, how do you go through this acquisition process? What, what's the trick for negotiation? Something I, I learned from uh, McCormack, the guy who wrote the book, uh, What You Never Learn at uh, Harvard Business School, is very important, is uh, negotiation needs to listen aggressively. Listening aggressively is a secret of fabrication that is so efficient. Why is that so? Because, you know, if you're listening more than you used to do, if you're listening to the last note, what the other is saying, you're able to capture uh, his face expression, his body gesture. You're also able to feel his recent or his satisfaction. And knowing him better, you're able to organize a proposal that is matching its expectation with serving your own interest. Listening aggressively, it's exactly the contrary of what we are doing in family meeting, you know. Uh, my son is starting a, um, a sentence, uh, I cut him and the third one is finishing the sentence. It's a, don't do that in business. You can do it at home, but not in business. 
And I think uh, in the idea of having this relationship with the other, with your counterpart, don't forget the sense of humor. In French, humor and amour are very close. Uh, that seems doesn't mean the same thing. Love is not uh, humor, but still, having a bit of sense of humor is allowing to get the pressure away. And uh, so don't take yourself too seriously, life is not that long, and uh, get the pressure away by listening to the other and put a bit of fun. I'd like to tell you just a story about that because I, I love it particularly. I'm not, I'm, I'm not too long. No, you're fine. Okay. Uh, some years ago, I was in a very difficult negotiation uh, about purchasing a distressed property with uh, English bankers who were at the brink of losing everything. And uh, my president and I were in the negotiation in the final stage, and we were in such a superiority position. We were so powerful. They were such in a pain that there was an atmosphere in the board meeting room totally unpleasant. And suddenly we were, woof! It was the dog of my president. I didn't know he was there. It was under the table. And uh, it just woof. So everybody looked under the table and said, oh, there's a dog. And we started to laugh and have a drink and so on. And we finally signed the deal at the restaurant. And everybody was not anymore uh, depressed. So when I was alone with my president, I just told him, uh, so Mr. Bremont, can you tell me it's really a chance that the dog has woofed at this time. And he looked at me and said, you're so unprofessional. I kicked him. <laughs> <laughs> win win, that's something I've learned at school as well. Is it for real? I think it's very difficult to find a win win solution to a negotiation. I think it's a good idea. It's very important to look toward that. But uh, it's very rare that I find a deal in which both parts have won the same amount. So I think going back to the sense of humor and the respect you owe to the other, win win, I understand it that you win, but you respect the other and you give him the chance to lose honorably. It's not very politically correct, I'm sorry. <laughs> You were asking earlier, uh, how do you appreciate? Uh, how do you know in evaluation? It's very important to sketch. You're not able to. You're working with an architect, with a designer, and you get preliminary images of what would be the future project. That's a sketch we've done in the early stage of ARC 1950 with Eldon Beck. And uh, you see the level of precision we arrived. We nearly add the matter to the construction of the whole resort. Another tool is uh, words and numbers. Uh, if you list things to some teachers or to some schools that would emphasize the question of figures, the profit, ROS, the return on sales, the number of square meters, and so on. Figures are there to serve the story. And storytelling is a very early part of, of a project. A project done with figures only is devoted to be a sinister. You need to have a true story. You need to respect the genius logic. You need to look for the poetry of the place, how you're going to emphasize some natural features of the site, how you're going to take advantage of the history of the cultural background in order to build the project. So I'll come back on that also. But I think don't forget that figures are nothing without the words going along with them. And obviously, all this, you reported it into a simplified pro forma, and that's uh, the last uh, advice that has been very useful to me because it, I, I learned it from professional. When you are making your primary evaluation of a project, don't be too optimistic. Create provision, financial provision for everything against the rain, against the sun, against the last uh, minute problem on the road that 
forbid the trucks to come and so on. And in that case, you'll be able to have reserve that could come back to the, share, to, to the investor at the end, but it's very prudent attitude, which would help you to gain the respect of your clients. And uh, to finish this first part, because we are going to break very soon, I say make your own mind. And that's a question you asked earlier, both of you. It's difficult. It's uh, get yourself training. It's a personal training. Get your own mind. That's the story of the Miller, his son, and the donkey. Uh, as you know the story, the Miller was on the donkey entering into the city. And uh, everybody was gossiping about the Miller who was such a nasty guy because he let his son walking in the dust behind him. So the Miller was shocked and get down from the donkey, offered the donkey to his son, and they continued working. And la all the people were laughing at them because the Miller was a respectable man, age, was working in the dust while his son was on the donkey. So they decided to both walk by the donkey, and people were laughing at them because nobody was using the donkey as a service. So the story, the end of this story is make your own mind. Don't listen to too many. You can listen to people for the study wise part, but there is a part of the developer, there is a part of this work where you can do, you must do alone. And uh, because I need a drink, I'm going to offer you not a coffee break, but a chocolate break, because uh, Nina and I have brought chocolates for you from Switzerland. <laughs> It's to buy you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to circulate. <laughs> so should we take a break for a minute? Yes, okay. if you allow. So you can take a break and stand up and stretch and enjoy a little snack. You like it? Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> Let me get a coffee of it. You want it? <laughs> I need water. <laughs> I have a few guests coming. section about envisioning and master planning there again like for acquisition and negotiation this would need a full day speaking and working together to really get in depth but just wanted to go through this part uh, with few few hints what is envisioning The method we've developed with several professionals, among which Gary, is uh, when we start a new project, we used to meet for one, two days in a very uh, quiet, retired place, pleasant, with uh, all the stakeholders. You can have the representative from the advertising company, uh, specialist in construction. You can get also people from the community uh, explaining you what would be the new works going on uh, around for the skiing resort or by the seashore, whatever the project is. And uh, someone leads uh, the meeting and uh, this envisioning is under the direction of a secretary and then uh, an architect who's taking back all the information and that's on this basis that we start building a uh, multi-dimensional, a multi-parameter type of project. I'd like to show you something that could be even better than a long explanation.
Okay, so sorry to interrupt the, the dreamlike story, uh, but more than a long explanation about envisioning, uh, I, I wanted to bring this small movie that we've done after an envisioning session with Gary and the team. You know, uh, when I, I was speaking about words being the counterpart of figures, um, obviously figures have their part to decide the feasibility of a project, but after all these meetings we had during two days, we are able to make this and more than a long explanation, it gives you the feeling of the future project. It, it gives you the atmosphere. So just to continue with the explanation about words and figures, I would say that we can work with logic, but we also need magic. And magic is lying in stories. Some figures can be magic too, but they usually after a good magical story. So from en envisioning, master planning, all this would require much more, but uh, master planning, uh, you know, um, the Romans were not that bad master planner because I would say that 85 or 90 percent of the cities lying in Western Europe are always based on their structure with the Cardo and the Cumanus. Um, to go quickly within that, I would say the master plan is not a master plan. Master plan is not a plan. That's a common mistake I've been making for years. Master plan is a sum of different plans. And uh, when you get all these plans together, you get something that is again different. What is this? The sum of different plans because if you're looking, uh, le let's take the next slide, for example, on the master plan of ARC 1950. When I saw the first time the drawing that uh, Eldon Beck was doing, I didn't understand. Um, I thought it was pretty hazardous. Then I discovered that there was a first layer, uh, a first layout of the plan, which was totally devoted to the natural environment. Eldon has decided uh, we would count all the trees present. Uh, this project is 2,000 meter high, so trees are very rare. And uh, he decided to protect them, so we counted all the trees, and uh, we had special attention to all the trees in front of the construction of the building. And for a project of that size, which represents nearly 100,000 square meter, 1 million square feet, uh, I can tell you it's very difficult to take care of all the trees. So that was the first layer. We took care of the wind to organize a building in order to protect them to uh, heavier snowfall. Uh, and uh, then you have a second layer of the project, which is the commercial master plan. And that's a whole story, and it needs another lecture, uh, Mark, to speak about that. Because you don't put uh, the retail shop uh, like the ski lift tickets at just any place in the plan. Ski lift tickets in a skiing resort and the bakery, you can put them in a hidden place because people will find it. Whereas a restaurant needs to be very visible because it would enhance the commercial activity into it. So you see that for the commercial master plan, which is another layer, there is another type of work. And there is a back of house and so on. So I will not get into all this now, but uh, envisioning is directly deriv derivating on the story, on the marketing that comes after, and also on the master plan. Another view of uh, of the master plan constructed of ARC 1950 showing you the street. Uh, living with the master plan is uh, also another story because the master plan, when it's correctly done, uh, with this level of uh, complexity into it, um, creates a s the background for the rules uh, the authorization for the fences, uh, the terraces of the restaurant, and all this could be mastered from this uh, part of the, of, the, of the design. I see the time flowing, so I, I need to go a little bit quicker. Uh, development and construction. I could spend the whole evening telling you a story. Uh, my wife would tell you it's terrible. But let's focus on another step of the, of the project, which is development. So we, we said at the very beginning that development is understood here as an organic concept, as um, 
getting a, a plant to grow from its original seed uh, to develop. The, the project is the same with the seed, the DNA made by the story and the figures, you can develop satisfactory your plant. And um, I can give you an example, it was done in the 50s here. You see, our job is very easy. <laughs> Um, I didn't want it to put these slides coming, but from the 50s with Tex Savary, the house of tomorrow, to uh, now there is a bridge, I, I would go very quickly, which shows that some people are building up a concrete copier, three-dimensional. So copying object in concrete from the original, and uh, we'll go quickly through it, but also uh, they consider building houses copied from the original, which is weird after text every, but you know, concrete structure copied from the original. Incredible. So we're not far from text every. But to come back to the object of this lecture, I would really insist that from my experience, a necessary tool you really need to have is not the 3D copier. It's more to have the vision statement, this, fonda uh, this uh, foundation uh, of, the, of the storytelling, especially accurate in the case of a resort because you need to have the overall story of the project. Mission statement would be what comes after the vision statement for each specific building and the economic analysis for the overall and the pro forma for each one. What's the other quality for the developer? I think uh, working as a developer requires, I, I know it looks a little bit cliche, but uh, working as a team. Working as a team, it's very important. Uh, you cannot develop projects like we saw, we are developing with Gary uh, alone. Uh, you can only do it with so many stakeholders that you need somebody to unify the team, the developer, which is the one who's taking the ball here from the marketing to throw it back to the construction and, uh, and so on. And is somehow is a quarterback holding the strategy and disappearing when it needs to disappear to let the specialists develop each one of their part of the project and uh, going on. Very important mixed is uh, the construction develop the construction manager and the development manager needs to be like King and Yang. They need to be so close to each other. Uh, if you have not this uh, proximity between them, you are facing very deep difficulties. Um, actually, uh, if you look at the right hand side, in the sense of time, the project starts with a kickoff meeting, with a schematic design, and during all this time, up to the building permit and the construction drawing starting, the developer is the boss. But he needs to have in his back the construction manager to tell him there is a mistake, you're losing money. And uh, then after, in the second part, on the left hand side, construction contract is being drafted, then signed, and gone. the progress review on site. That's the work where the construction manager is leader. But the developer should be just by his shoulder to be sure that the story we've decided together to tell, that the vision statement, that the master plan is really respected. So you will tell me, yeah, but this is abstract. So how does, that, how does it look at the end? So I, I just wanted to show you a picture of Arc 1950. We started the construction in March 2002 and uh, completed it in uh, April 2007, five years during which we built uh, nearly one million square feet, three level of underground parking, 55,000 square feet of retail and shops, 
and this result has become since uh, the highest level of occupancy uh, in the whole French mountain. We've got uh, eight awards for this project. I even got an award that I didn't know I received, so <laughs> <laughs> that's another story. And uh, if we come back to the early part of the presentation, remember we are speaking about sketch. Look at this. We are not that far. Delivery and closing would be the last part of your, of your whole ordeal. Um, don't mistake delivery and closing. Delivery is achieved when the construction is done and you're ready to hand over the unit or building to the owner. Closing is when the money changes hands. Ideally, delivery and closing should be going together. Um, the problem is uh, Everybody is making mistakes, and if you have not followed all the steps thoroughly, you can arrive to some mistakes like this one, you know. We were doing a project in Mont Tremblant, Quebec, and uh, we forgot about the story. We worked too quickly, and who would like to go in such a entry of hotel. It's not very welcoming. It's not that bad, but it's just a mistake. Dark breeze, not attractive. So looking back, from the developer's point of view, the delivery period is a great moment to reflect and look back with objectivity at the project. What went well? What didn't? We used to speak about uh, diagnostic uh, after a while, post-mortem, it's not that fun. But it's very important to do it after the completion of the project. What mistakes were made? At what point? What can we improve in our process? What could have we done differently? So self-reflection is really essential and you need to do it in team. For instance, you know, uh, what happens when mechanical and electrical are not co properly coordinated? There, for instance, we lost nearly one meter high in the ceiling just because there was not this interaction between the development and the construction manager. They didn't like to hit together. So they didn't share information at the right time. And the result is just uh, a mistake. The same, you know, lack of coordination between commercial and residential developers in a, in a resort can cause a, a stone column to block the entrance of a shop. Too bad, just happened. <laughs> so from this, even the best make mistakes. Uh, I, I think uh, life is full of setbacks. So success is determined by how you, you, you handle these setbacks. And I, I would like to finish this part with uh, my, my probably last advice, which is the, the most important one when dealing with others. We are working for them, investors, clients, friends under promise over deliver. It's really the same question as for the simplified performance of the economic analysis. You take provision, you do not promise a big return because the investor would be so surprised that you're giving an additional revenue when the co project is completed. The same for the quality, the subjective quality should overpass what the expectation were. So don't promise too much, and in that case, you'll be probably able to over deliver. And uh, I think learning from mistakes help us to create attractive and dynamic environments, no matter what time or season. Uh, just wanted to show two pictures of Mont Tremblant in Quebec. I've been very lightly participating at the main street in summer or in winter. My baby, uh, you know, when the development goes right, you can create magical private places. And uh, just for Gary, when development goes right, you can create magical private places. Everybody is dreaming of, of, of your terrace, Gary. <laughs> So losing, losing it all and learning from it, you know, and two or eight, uh, it was a bad surprise. Uh, no job, 
nothing else and to rebuild. The first stuff I learned is uh, you can call one of the 100 or 200 person you knew, less than 10 will answer. So better have a solid core of relatives around you, your wife, your friends, some few folks who help you to rebuild from that. And no reason to get pessimistic because you're going to create something better. And uh, something my wife is often saying is, uh, well, you know, you, you need to be used to the fact that people are not creating companies for lifelong jobs anymore they create companies to sell them after five years. So in that case, uh, I have decided that going to better, we can reverse the cartoon and go from rags to rich. It could be reversed. <coughs> So in that context, I've been explaining to some of you that I'm still a shareholder of SDG, but uh, looking forward to new venture. I'm very glad to take the opportunity tonight to uh, invite you for the discovery of a company that has not yet a website, so don't look for it, but uh, it will be very soon made, uh, Swiss Living. And uh, I had to invent a tagline, and I considered that this one is not the best, but it really represents this optimist feeling I would like to share with you the future is full of futures do it so now ready for questions <laughs> uh, you can question the architect <laughs> <laughs> uh, the demands of, of the luxury clientele are continuing to evolve and they see more new hotels with, with great attributes I'm curious you know, what, in terms of being able, to speak, uh, being able to stay ahead of the game from an architectural side or from an interior design side, what have you tried to do with your projects to truly really make those projects very appealing to your clientele? Hmm. I think uh, if I understand well the question, uh, try to answer the following way. Uh, the le leading principles in, in my mind were two principles. One, you need to uh, deliver uh, sound patrimonial investment, quality of construction, quality of everything that is delivered that should be unsurpassed. Uh, you, you cannot cheat with that. Uh, if the quality is there, uh, your client will be satisfied like the one who's buying a diamond ring at a great jeweler, uh, 50 years later the, the jewel will be still worthwhile, whereas if you buy it at a nearby supermarket, probably you lose the stone in two weeks. So sound investment mixed with the widest array of services available to allow people to live the way they want to live. So that's the general principles I've followed. Projects are sort of in the, the luxury space. Uh, I was wondering, have you been getting any pushback from your LPs regarding uh, uh, because of confidence levels in the because of the year of debt crisis? I, I really have trouble hearing. It's okay. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I was just saying because a lot of your developments are in the luxury space. Are you getting any uh, resistance from your LPs to uh, to find more luxury uh, projects? What, what's LPs? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, your investors. Okay. Uh, is there any resistance from the investors for yeah. that? Um, no, I think. Uh, we would have resistance from the investors if we were dealing only with a residential unit on sales. But uh, the investors actually are very eager to find us developing luxury project, but in the hotel industry. Uh, they are very interested to move to, to SWIFT uh, from uh, sovereign debt to investment in stone. So if you offer an investor uh, a project uh, that is delivering a, a normal return, a, a satisfactory IRR uh, in, in the next future in the luxury business, I would be happy. I think they will less support the, uh, you know, uh, individual sales. 
I think Phil touched on an interesting point, though. Um, where do you see on, on the horizon? Is it a? Are you going to weather it, or is it going to be difficult given the euro uh, uh, crisis right now? The financial crisis mm -hmm. seems to be culminating in, in Europe. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on the future of European real estate given that? Well, uh, I would say that uh, Switzerland actually is not in uh, the UE and uh, for many different means. So still the country is in Europe but does not have really strong relationship. Um, what you're saying is relating for me to, to a belief I have, but it's not scientific, it's a belief, you know. Uh, I am believing that uh, we are going one day or another uh, facing uh, tremendous inflation. We have had uh, a conference by the chief uh, economist of uh, the leading bank in Switzerland, UBS, uh, some weeks ago. He, he was speaking about catch-up inflation, which is, you know, you turn the bottle, it's not coming, you turn the second time, and suddenly you have it all. So they don't know when the inflation is coming. Uh, the only stuff that the Prevision service of UBS is saying it's uh, going to be a two digit inflation. Uh, it's going as sudden that you can lose 10% of your belongings in one night and they don't know when it's coming. I is it in three weeks? Is it in two years or in five? Uh, I, I we don't know more, you know. Uh, as the Maurice was saying, it's very difficult to make provision, especially when they deal with future. But uh, still, uh, I believe inflation is going to give favor to real estate, whatever the country. Hi, you, uh, you mentioned some of the design blunders, um, you know, uh, stone hall in front of the entrance. Can you share maybe some examples of how you've been able to work around those or if you had to actually redo construction on some of the projects? Uh, do, do we have to co correct them? Correct. Normally, when the mistake is made in three dimension, it's very difficult to correct. And you have to live with it because, you know, the deliveries program and so on. I don't know if you have a different standpoint, Gary, on that. No, I think it's, it's once you build something, it's hard to take to get rid of it. Especially if it's things, if things like ceiling heights and you, you've got a mechanical system. They're building. It's like a rolling stone. I mean, you can't stop it. it you, at some point, the costs just multiply so drastically when you try to correct mistakes. It's better really to kind of look at them. I guess, well, I'm sorry. It's more what I was getting at is maybe just the, uh, if you mitigate the operations of the building, if you do things differently to, to mitigate, you know, the mistake. You know what? Yeah. My, my experience is that uh, when the mistake was made, we really had our time to correct it. And you know, it is vicious because the mistake can be very little at the beginning and uh, take more and more importance. I remember in uh, Arc 1950, we were making a, a big hall uh, devoted to be a meeting uh, room for 300, 500 person, and uh, I noticed that the structural engineer was not spending enough time with us in meetings, and uh, he was known as a very good engineer, so I was confident. I was wrong. You shall not be confident any time. You shall survey everything they are doing. And actually, I was wrong not to survey what he did, because when he discovered that he made mistakes. He started to create pillars on both sides of the room. That makes that the room is uh, losing 10% of its capacity when you have sitting people. You know that's so. There is no really tricks except that to review what you're doing all the time and be uh, gently, but all the time above the shoulder of the different stakeholders of your team. And actually, that goes one of the places you can find some mistakes. I think when Nicholas was talking about the simplified pro forma, because if you don't just run the numbers and you look at the areas, there are metrics in the industry. So if you, mechanical space is suddenly 20% of your building program, when industry standards is 7%, then you can see the mistake 
at an early schematic phase and fix it, but you have to understand it. So I think that when you look at the metrics early on, hopefully some of those things are fine. I mean, you know, mistakes with windows or doors or things like that you can live with, but big problems you need to really catch in a kind of early, early phase. Um, and it's just understanding, looking at the whole picture. Yes. Yes. You. Oh, um, th you've worked for other people, you know, throughout the years. What are the most important things you think you've learned from working for other people that you're now applying to like, a more entrepreneurial endeavor that you wouldn't have otherwise had if you had just struck out on your own right out of college? If I understand your question, what what did I learn from other people uh, in all this? For other people that you're now applying entrepreneurially. Well, that's a very wide question. Huh? Um, Maybe the, uh, the better question is, do you think it's important if you want to do something entrepreneurial to work for other companies first? Do you think that experience is really valuable? Well, I, I really don't know. I think there are two types of uh, cases that I saw. There are people who are just getting out of school even before their degree. Uh, we know one uh, who's just an entrepreneur and started to create business everywhere. Uh, uh, I was a different way, you know. I, I followed different paths. I wanted to be an architect, so I worked as an architect. Then I wanted to go into development. And so I think there is no rules, really. Um, I believe there is no rules about that. But my, my experience doesn't show me any rules. Um, the only stuff that is really important is to be prudent. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, every developer has like a dream project, something that you want to build. So the question is, have you built your dream project or do you plan to build it in the future? Uh, that's a good one. Huh? I think uh, each project that I'm starting is a dream project. And when it's finished, normally it's a nightmare project. <laughs> <laughs> because I remember all the blunders and so on. But still, uh, as a dream project, I think uh, Arc 1950 uh, on one side is uh, great deal of satisfaction because, you know, uh, I came back there, I'm totally unknown, you know, the nurse story. So I wanted to enter the hotel I built and the concierge told me, who are you? I said, I just built it. No, uh, listen, you're not on my list. That's very satisfactory. And the second project is the one that uh, we, we are starting the construction this spring with Gary, which you saw some pictures and this uh, poetic movie with uh, the spring and so on. And I'm very, uh, very much in, in love with this project because I know where we started we started with a building <coughs> permit existing, which was so awful that uh, you really need all the talent of the team of Gary and his expertise to transform it into something that was acceptable first. And I think now is really a great piece of architecture, very well celebrated. And uh, I think it deserves it. So this dream project is when we'll be able to enter into it, I'll be very satisfied. Question. One is, what made you decide to start a development company right after the financial crisis? And two, how could you get finance for your project in a time there was no capital available at all? Okay, that's a very good question. The first stuff is I don't know how to do something else. So, you know, I'm not a shoemaker. Um, uh, I only know how to develop real estate projects. So I look for projects with the support of my wife and my children, and we look for six, seven months. And how we did obtain a, a, a financial support? By luck. Also because I was listening a lot of people speaking uh, gently to others and uh, a job, uh, head hunter that I knew told me, hey, you know, you spoke to me about this Hotel du Parc you, you were looking at. Uh, I met a guy, he's very, um, very mighty, he's got uh, huge investment capabilities, but he's totally unable to develop a project, you should meet him. 
And actually, I, I went to meet the guy, uh, Elias, and uh, when I got out, I called Nina and said, uh, well, you know, it's been very positive. Uh, we spoke half an hour together, and uh, I think it's, and she told me, it's not half an hour, you're led by two hours. Actually, it fits so well with the other person that uh, we started to work without to have the structure and so on. So, you know, mm -hmm. round down and luck. So I just want to make sure, um, I'm just curious actually, how much are those units? And at, is it five or one or f uh, 50 51? Uh, and then um, just like the average price and also what was your rationale behind the new company, Swiss Living, that you guys are? Okay, so the units, we, we can say that they, they are ranking from what, uh, 1,000 square feet to 3,000 square feet for two or three units. And the average price, uh, I'm not totally sure, but it should be about um, between 1.4 million to 2.5 per unit. And uh, the rationale behind uh, Swiss living, uh, you, you have the only uh, employee of the company today in front of you, that's me. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's small today, but uh, I'm confident in the future. Uh, the company, the, the idea was coming from discussion, we are together. And the idea is to develop an expensive uh, student housing, uh, first in Switzerland, uh, because there is a tremendous lack of student housing in, in Western Europe, in Switzerland in particular. And uh, well, we believe in it and we think that we, we can uh, develop such project uh, to the satisfaction uh, of the students and uh, to the satisfaction of the investors. And uh, some market studies I've met show that on the financial market in UK and in the US, these products are very well celebrated by the investors. And uh, it's a dessert actually in Western Europe. Not in America, but in Western Europe. It's uh, And uh, what I saw also is maybe a little presumptuous, but uh, I, I think uh, there are some initiatives, but they totally lack professionalism, uh, do not provide standardized product, they do not take care of the student's expectation, and uh, I think uh, we, can, we can do that. I, I think we've got the skill with the architects, we know the designer and so on to do it, so I'm pretty confident. Okay, right. um, so when you, you develop your initial vision or story, uh, could you talk a little bit about as you start to move forward, how the, does the story ever change? Do you have to... You mean for the result, uh, vision general, statement and so? Well, in general, yeah, with, with developments you have. For the experience I had, you shall not play with a story and you shall not play with a master plan without getting most of the stakeholders meeting again and deciding it's a good idea. Because if you've made all this tremendous work to meet with the architect, with the designer, with the advertising company and so on, and suddenly because you're the development director of the project, you decide that, well, we'll move it a little bit likewise and we're not going this shop here and so on. It's useless to have done this work before and uh, you're probably facing difficulties. I had one difficulty, like I, I did that, I made this blunder. Uh, I had this master plan completely organized on ARC 1950 and uh, the architect of the first phase of the project told me, you know Nicholas, if we were changing the slope of the street from 4 to 4.5 percent, we could achieve this and that and it would be better for the pipes and so on. So I said, I probably should do it. So I called the master planner in California, held on, told him, could I do that? He said, your responsibility. I, I do not support it. Your responsibility. Two years later, I was in the second phase construction and I started to discover that the 0.5 change of slope made that the big plaza 
was going in the midst of the facade of the, com uh, of the shops, you know. So there was a way of solving this. It was to change the slope of the disabled ramp, but this was not legal. So, you know, I say when you're dealing with a simple project, you can, but dealing with a resort, start meeting with the others, bring all the stakeholders and do not take a decision alone. Yes, sir. What kind of issues do you run into is securing approval from local uh, jurisdictions to get your projects built? That's, that's missing from your equation. It's a very big part of getting projects built in this country. Ca can you explain me a little bit? Entitlement to get your permission or permits to, to develop your project. What are the kinds of, of, of exactions or requirements that you encounter from local government? Ah, the, the type of uh, expectation we had from the local government. Well, you know, today uh, it's very different of the late 90s or, or the 90s where we could expect in some projects uh, financial support of the collectivity and so on. And uh, we are saying, so we are creating a resort, we are creating uh, 500 jobs, so you pay for the pipes and the road and so on. But I think this era is in the past. Today, we are very happy when meeting with the mayor of a community is just saying, okay, uh, I'm okay with you to apply for that, but don't expect any support from me. That's already a chance because he's not an opponent. Well, I'm speaking about Western Europe. Huh? So, uh, for example, you know, in Duparc, we had uh, the day of the delivery of a building permit, 28 opposition. Can you believe that? 28 legal suits against the project, five coming from major national associations, 23 from individuals. And uh, I went to visit the mayor, and they said, okay, that's your trouble. And uh, we did it alone and our tool was negotiation, listing aggressively, keeping the sense of humor, etc. <laughs> but we succeeded. Uh, I'll, I'll ask, I, I have a usual question that I ask, so the peop some people will be smiling here as I ask it. Um, when, you, when you have spare time, what kinds of things do you like to read? Uh, Books or magazines or? Books, okay. yeah. What, what types of books? My favorite are uh, about archaeology, mm -hmm. but uh, I read so many of these that I don't find new books. So if you have some, I'm crazy <laughs> about the Roman era 2,000 years ago, and uh, also uh, detective stories and stuff like that. Uh, no, nothing very, very clever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are there any ad additional questions? Well, again, thank you, Nicholas, for Thank coming. you so much. Thank you for listening.